Uh, bonjour, good afternoon. Hope everyone enjoyed their lunch and we're not all too sleepy. Um, so my name is Charlotte Rowe. I'm the Scholarly Communications Librarian at the University of San Francisco, which is a small Jesuit university next to Golden Gate Park. And because it's a Jesuit university, it has a social justice mission. Um, Apologies to those of you who've heard me speak already, particularly my US librarian colleagues, has been saying mostly the same thing for the past year. Um, and thank you so much to PKP for having me here and to our hosts in this beautiful city. And thank you to the founders and supporters of OJS and all of you here who have been working so long in the open access movement. Uh, truly, we stand on the shoulders of giants and I am fortunate to do so not only because I'm a petite person, but because when I came into the library profession some four years ago, I came into a fully realized scholarly communication structure, the groundwork laid by those who came before me. Um, in year one, I argued with faculty authors about how their societies were funded. I'm sure you guys have all done that. Uh, but by year four, I only had to say, open public access is a social justice outcome, and everyone at my university nodded their heads and agreed. So uh, we've come a long way, and I am relatively late to the open access movement. Uh, but I also come into the field with some perspective, having left academic publishing for a number of reasons. When I left Oxford University Press, I worked in English language learning, which is a rewarding but particularly vulnerable sector. I did not realize that the slashing of US school budgets and adult learning programs in 2008, 2009, extended to higher education, particularly library budgets, and that this battle had been taking place for a long time. I did not realize the extent to which corporate profits and publishing went hand in hand, despite the fact that I had worked at Taylor and Francis and knew it as a part of Informa. So I was, like many people, completely ignorant of the ways in which capitalism and academia work together and how our systems are set up to reinforce those in power. And we can see this in how, even with the success of the open access movement, corporations are subverting open access models, acquiring journals, platforms, software, preprint servers, and copyrights over not only articles, but conference proceedings and our personal and professional data. These are things everyone in this room already knows, that the economics of publishing, even open access publish publishing, are not just and fair. We are confident in our goodness as open access advocates and providers, what my co colleague Fabazi Attar calls vocational awe. I'm here to challenge that belief that we are not complicit. Uh, and the reason we continue to be complicit is because we reinforce the capitalist neoliberal values of scholarly publishing that still reflect the colonialist structures of the university. For example, the Oxford University Press website claims that Oxford University Press is the world's largest university press with the widest global presence. They have offices in New York, Canada, Australia, India, South Africa, all places where the British Empire had established a strong colonial foothold. The claim that Oxford University Press is the largest university press in the world may well be because the sun never set on the British Empire. Similarly, Elsevier's success as the largest academic publisher in the world can be correlated with the success of the Dutch Empire. In fact, as some of you know, Reed Elsevier was involved in the international arms trade, also part of colonialism, until outrage from the medical community forced it to divest. In the United States, our higher educational systems were, frankly, funded and built on slavery. I recommend the book Ebony, Ebony and Ivy by Craig Stephen Wilder if you're unfamiliar with how slavery built America's universities. As academic publishers, we continue to reinforce these injustices, not just economically, but through the reinforcement of what my colleague Nicole Gonzalez Howell calls a prestige dialect and power code, AKA standard edit, edited academic English. There have been studies done on how the quality of English or the ethnicity of the name of the author has an impact on how the content and work is perceived. Some of us in this room are acutely aware of this as a personal reality, both for ourselves and for faculty at our institutions. In fact, I learned yesterday that here in Quebec, this form of culture, cultural snobbery exists for those who speak and write in perfect French, what my colleague April Hathcock calls performative whiteness. So peer review, like the old adage about justice, is not really blind. And here are some examples from this year. Just in 27, Amer American Historical Review 
a leading history journal, apologized for assigning a review of a book about urban inequality to a white supremacist. Hypatia, a feminist philosophy journal, apologized for and retracted a paper that analogized Rachel Dolezal to transgender people. The Journal of Political Philosophy apologized for an issue devoted to the Black Lives Matter movement that included zero black authors. And in Canada, how many of you are familiar with this? Show of hands. Okay, some of you. Some of you are not. Uh, the Writers Union of Canada, in their quarterly publication, Write Magazine, published an editorial that began with the statement, I don't believe in cultural appropriation. Why did he write such a thing? Because the issue was on indigenous writing and featured indigenous authors. <laughs> um, the Writers Union apologized, and the editor who wrote the piece voluntarily resi resigned. But it didn't end there. Several high-ranking writers and editors in Canadian media not only came to his defense, but started pooling together money to create an appropriation prize for whoever would best appropriate indigenous heart heritages. Those tweets have since been deleted. <laughs> um, and this all sounds horrible, but these publications are actually quite unique in having apologized, and all of them identified that something had gone wrong in the editorial process. There were a range of reasons. The editors had not fully understood, they had chosen reviewers who were not appropriate. They had chosen authors without considering fully the implications. But all of these journals also apologized in the wake of publicity and outcry. How many peer review processes and published articles have there been that were not so transparent, that went unreported in Inside Higher Ed or the Chronicle of Education? How did this happen? This is the slide that I show graduate students and faculty when I do publishing workshops in my day-to-day -day job. It's a way of making transparent the peer review process, because for those who are early in their careers or haven't been reviewers, having it visualized is very helpful. It's also, as an aside, a way of making it clear where the library is a part of the process, because many of our authors don't let us know what they publish, and we'd like to have their preprints and books in our libraries. So after I go through my workshop, which includes more than this, um, and take questions, then I ask them, do you want to see my secret slides? Yes. Yes. They always want to see my secret slides. Yeah. So this data is from the Lee and Lowe Diversity Baseline Survey, published in 2015, um, with Professor Sarah Dolan Park, who does amazing work in diversity in children's books. As you can see, 79% of publishing professionals are white. This includes the industry overall. At the executive level, it is 86% white, and at the editorial level, 82% white. Um, and the survey actually goes into detail to say that 96% of executives are non-disabled, 92% of editors are non-disabled. Um, I encourage you all to take a look at the results because it includes responses from eight review journals and 34 publishers, so quite, quite good. This <laughs> is scholarly publishing professionals at just over 90% white. <clears throat> when I received this survey, there was no category for Asian or Asian American. So I contacted the researchers to let them know that this was a problem, because from personal experience, there were Asians and Asian Americans in publishing. <laughs> the response is that, because the survey was intended to be international, even though it was in English, they had decided against the category because it might be confusing. Perhaps I should choose mixed or multiple this was, of course, ridiculous, and thankfully they reversed course and let me know a couple days later. Um, I'll also note that this survey was not sent to the Association of American University Presses nor Library Publishing, although some press people did receive it and fill it out. Um, I thought about doing a follow-up survey just for university presses and library publishers, but I couldn't conceive of a way to do that with ambiguity because some presses are quite tiny and have only one, two, or no people of color. So those results would have been difficult to keep people anonymous. So these are the demographics for faculty. According to the US National Center for Education Statistics, this is from 2013, but honestly, I can't imagine this being too different now in 2017. In an article published last year called Academic Waste, Kelly Baker writes, statistically contingent academic labor is gendered and raced. The typical faculty member has become a female non-tenurable part-timer earning a few thousand dollars a year without health benefits. 
Women still make up the majority of the contingent faculty. According to Vita's new job tracker, 61% of available tenure track jobs in 2013-2014 went to men. Non-tenurable faculty and non-teaching staff are more likely to identify themselves as belonging to an ethnic or racial minority rather than tenure stream faculty. So I only include full-time faculty because when I was still in the business of assigning peer reviews, I looked at a professor's rank and publication record to see whether they had authority in the field and therefore the ability to discern high quality. These are the demographics for librarianship. Not much better. And the demographics, demographics for academic librarianship. From, these are from the American Library Association, so I'm not sure if Canada tracks that as well, or, um, but 86% white. As you can see, um, very similar to the other statistics we've looked at. Um, the American Library Association also includes statistics on gender and disability work status as well. Now, none of this is intended to be an attack on these professions, uh, but I do want you to hold these demographics graphics in your mind and think to yourself, who holds the power in these dynamics? Uh, I have an unusually global audience in this room, but I would not be surprised if we all had similar issues as we do in the US. Uh, certainly, sexism exists everywhere, for example. Did you know that women are asked to review less often? What are re the results, then, of these power dynamics? Because if you do not publish, particularly in prestige outlets, then you cannot be promoted and you cannot achieve tenure. So the result, in the United States at least, is a revolving door of faculty of color who do the work, then leave. I'm not sure if you can read the print, but the caption says that Facebook keeps scrubbing the image of the faculty of color who have left Dartmouth over the past 15 years. I can't imagine why Facebook would be scrubbing this image unless someone was requesting that it be taken down. <laughs> Uh, that said, Facebook and technology in general also have huge problems since algorithms are not neutral, but that's a whole other talk. Suffice to say that I was glad yesterday and today to see so many people presenting on technology solutions that are not out of Silicon Valley. <laughs> um, I also want to note that for many of these faculty, they did all the right things. They published, they worked hard, they were amazing educators and researchers, but the academic institution is not interested in their permanence. And students notice. Um, this is a chart put together by the Data Journalism Organization 538. You'll notice that the most common demand at 51 schools with student protests in the United States is to increase the diversity of professors. Um, there are now 80 schools on their source list, which is themdemands.org. 80 is a lot. It is a lot of schools for which they need more diversity of professors. So what can we do? I feel that we're at a unique point in publishing. Many of us are already aware that through open access publishing, we have been able to create space for different voices that have been told that the market is not there for their work. We have people in new and emerging dis interdisciplinary fields, graduate students, and even, as I learned yesterday, high school students. I personally am very excited about the newest journal that I'm working on, the International Jour Journal of Human Rights Education. The first call for papers is out now. And as a scholarly communications librarian at an institution that supports social justice, I feel empowered to speak frankly and clearly, clearly about how we can address these problems. My action points are straightforward and vary only slightly depending on the audience. I ask for awareness and cultural competencies to understand histories and realities in race, gender, sexuality, ability, and culture in order to subvert our bias systems. To publishers, I ask that we interrogate our existing structures editorial boards, reviewers, authors, readers, content language, to see where we are and how we could do better. In the words of Sophia Noble, the gatekeeping function of publishing is fundamental to issues of social justice. If you are not published, you cannot be classified and, classified and cataloged. As we have a large number of librarians in the room, the power of cataloging and classification are not new ideas and many are already interrogating purchasing decisions, our cataloging and discovery systems, and our own place in the scholarly communication system as we inhabit different roles. We are familiar with evaluating our collection decisions for the sake of budget cuts and rising costs, but we are still learning to wield that power proactively for the sake of representational equity. 
I am happy that in the US academic library environment, we are thinking about how metadata and money means what it means to access for access to authors, readers, and the broader scholarly community to whom our actions matter so much. For faculty and students, I urge that we consider ourselves as empowered members of an ecosystem rather than supplicants at publisher portals. Frequently, this means asking researchers to not only see themselves as authors, but also as reviewers and editors with power to change representation. We are all community members who can hold authors, reviewers, editors, and librarians, all that power graph I showed you earlier, accountable for how scholarship is communicated and represented. For the most part, the response has been positive, particularly from librarians, which I attribute to the long culture of self-criticism in the library profession. It's a nice way of saying navel gazing. Libraries have for decades had diversity programs in place, and encouragingly this year, the Library Publishing Coalition has a task force on ethics that includes diversity and bias as part of its charge. Publishing is also trying to change, largely in response to the 2015 Lee and Low Diversity Baseline Survey. The AAUP, funded by the Mellon Foundation, established a diversity fellowship program with the goal of increasing minority profession in the, representation in the profession. Three of the fellows have already been hired full-time, and the program has engendered conversations within the presses themselves about the need for diversity in our traditionally white supremacist systems. I recently went to a panel that reported on their efforts. It's not too late, all of them said. That's what they said, it's not too late. After the panel, I spoke briefly with the woman next to me who told me her, of her efforts to diversify the editorial board of the American Journal of Transplantation to include more international members, specifically China, who is, I don't think, represented here. It creates a false representation in our field, she said, if our editorial boards don't reflect the people who are actually doing the research. As an aside, I also learned at that panel from a member of the audience that Elsevier is actually going through diversity certification. I'm not sure what that entails, but I did learn that it is a part of their environmental certification process. I have thoughts on how open access publishing depends on technology that is harmful both to the environment and to people, but that's another talk. Um, the Society for Scholarly Publishing Alice Meadows, who's here in particular, have recently discussed gender parity amongst its members, although not yet how gender is represented in scholarly publishing in particular. Briefly, in 2013, two published studies addressed the over-representation of men in scholarly publications. The first study examined 5.4 million peer-reviewed scientific articles between 2008 and 2012 and found that 70% of the authors were men. The other study reviewed 8 million papers from JSTOR, <coughs> which is a broader subject areas, and found that only 27.2% of authors were women. For more on the topic, I suggest that you look up the work of Cassidy Sugimoto. Um, additional efforts to address these issues include the OpenCon diversity statement, I don't know if some of you have already seen that, and a pledge from the Open Library of the Humanities to monitor and release reports on demographics. These are all signs of step-by-step -step change, what I consider allyship in action, and I am encouraged to see them. Um, on a personal note, last year at the 2016 annual SSP meeting, a very well-meaning gentleman suggested that perhaps as the only minority in the room, I would benefit. I'm unable to describe the look that I felt on my face as I informed him that research and personal experience has shown that to be untrue. He walked away disappointed, and I had to question whether I was really benefiting from tokenism. I since come to realize that my tokenism is not my problem. I am grateful for the opportunities I've been offered, and I work very hard, as do all the successful women of color in my field, Representational equality is a well-intentioned step in the right direction, but it becomes tokenism not when the minorities that are included don't affect change, but when the white majority culture passively refuses to gain the cultural competencies that will turn the ship around. No wonder that when race and ethnicity are even tangentially involved, publishing often founders on the shoals of ignorance. This ignorance is dangerous because as well-meaning as any individual can be, racism, sexism, homophobia, and ableism are part of our culture internalized and revealed through our perceptions and values. We default to enabling and promoting the Western white male majority voice. We perpetuate the colonialist infrastructures of the university and police whether someone is plagiarizing, which is actually a Western ethical construct, or writing in proper English, which is a mark of class, privilege, and nationality. I'm guilty of this myself as an editor in academic publishing, both in my past career, in my present career as a scholarly communication librarian, and my work as an editorial freelancer and consultant. Um, as an open access advocate and library publisher, I was just challenged last week at the Society for American Archivists. Their cultural heritage working group has new protocols that provide for the rights and responsibilities of cultural groups and stakeholders while at the same time providing public access. It is there I learned about Mukurtu. Mukurtu are, you, are any of you familiar with Mukurtu? 
Oh, some of you are, fantastic, okay. Uh, it's an open access platform, open source platform, built with indigenous communities to manage and share digital cultural heritage. I had no idea it existed, that archivist, who do still work mostly in paper and pencil, were building open access platforms for and with indigenous cultural heritages. It is so important to build with and across communities. And as I say this, I think of how recently the University of California, Berkeley, deleted from public view thousands of lectures because they were not compliant with the Americans with Disability Act. It was the choice of the administration not to retroactively make these videos compliant. Rather, the decision was made to make them only accessible to Berkeley students. Having a disability is expensive. Access to higher education is expensive. This is effectively another form of paywall. How would this have been different if these open education materials had been ADA compliant to start with? From this and other examples, I want to remind us that the response from our institutions is not necessarily going to be in the public's best interests. Our institutions are not necessarily going to be open access friendly. Many of us already know this. Which is why it is important as open access publishers who do care and who have dual roles as gatekeepers and enablers that we learn more about the injustices around us. We have an opportunity to remake scholarly publishing, to look beyond the traditional systems of peer review and power for more inclusive intersectional publishing processes for social justice outcomes. And before I open the floor to questions, I want to acknowledge the people who are indigenous to this land noted on this slide. And the book on the right is just an open access inside joke. It's a long form poem using public domain text about Indians, published by Talon Books, which is here in Canada. Thank you so much, fantastic. Questions, come on up. Uh, hi, Charlotte, thank you. Um, so I actually, I wanted to uh, let you know about something and then I have a question. So I'm on the, um, ACRL uh, Publications Coordinating Committee, and we have a survey coming out soon that looks at uh, editorial representation within ACRL's publications and uh, includes diversity metrics. So um, I wanted to mention that, um, but I also wanted then to kind of tie into that a question that we had as a committee come up with, which was uh, using our survey results, we found that um, our ACRL, uh, Association of College and Research Libraries, uh, publications the editorial makeup represented the membership of the organization, um, but we wanted to take that a step further to note that it did not, however, represent the students that are um, uh, at all of the universities and colleges that we work at. So I wonder if, you know, in your slides of uh, sort of having the diversity statistics, if you, if you ever uh, connect any of that with uh, student demographics and how we know that that is a changing uh, demographic. Our students look increasingly different on our campuses, but are not represented, um, you know, kind of up up the ladder. Okay. Um, well, so there are, first of all, fantastic that you guys did that research. That's amazing. Um, I would say that representing ALA demographics is not a win. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but also, um, as we do see the increase of diversification of students, I also want to consider that um, there's a high dropout rate from the profession for people of color as well. So it's, I mean, it's a, it's a dual issue. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Alice. Um, that was a fabulous talk. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to expand a little bit on the point you made about um, SSP and that their diversity, um, looking at diversity, which is in its very early stages, but is a big step forward because it's taken quite a long time even to get to that point. Yeah. But um, uh, SSP is now kind of leading a, um, a multi-organisation initiative with representatives from a whole bunch of other um, scholarly publishing organisations, including AAUP and OASPA and a few others, yeah. um, specifically looking at diversity in all its forms. So I think we've, we've moved on. I, my special concern has been gender. I completely recognise that that's by no means the only issue um, um, but, it, but it's something that I've been working on for a while, but I'm really, really happy that both the, it's been expanded to other forms of diversity and that it, there's a sort of collaborative approach now, hopefully, to making some real progress in this area. Yeah, so yeah. thanks for the shout out for that. Thanks. Yeah. So on the software side, um, I feel like 
you, you gave a, a, a shout out, generous shout out to the Bay Area. Um, and there's many people who write software such as myself who are perpetually putting our foot in it. And with regard to OJS, for example, we have a gender field that we added at some point due to request. Uh, we originally had, I think, blank male and female. We then added other. Uh, I had a request on our support forum to add about six additional options. Uh, the country list we use is the UN country list, which includes Taiwan, common province of, comma, province of China. So um, as a well-meaning software practitioner, who's now been disabused of the view that we're just writing software, we're not doing anything political, yeah. um, how can <laughs> I come along. Yeah. do a better job on some of these issues? Um, I mean, you are, you've already made a start. And, that's, and the desire to learn more is big. There are lots of people in Silicon Valley who are already working on these issues and have been working on these issues for a long time. Continue to do what I've had to do and anybody's had to do, which is continue to read, continue to talk, continue to learn, yeah. Um, and just to follow up on the flip side, um, many of those current sensibilities are localized as well. So I'll frequently get a request from somebody in a different part of the planet who we're also very strongly trying to, to reach and to, to bring into scholarly communication worldwide, who will look at this, uh, this change we've made for the sake of the group that we're talking about here in the interest of doing the best thing we can and say, what is this? Um, how, how can we balance that beyond just telling people to, to go and modify their own installations or that sort of thing? I mean, it sounds like you have good communication streams, right? If people are coming to you and saying, what is this, right? I think one of the things we learned this week is that it's important to have good communication streams with your clients slash customers slash partners. Um, so that's, you have, one of the hard things about diversity work, because it's not formulaic, is you have to cross each bridge when you come to it. And so that's, that's the advice I have for you, is just to be as inclusive as possible and keep working on it. I will say it is a relief to hear that you don't think you know, software is apolitical, having been on the dating scene in the Bay Area, that was like a horrible conversation that I had over and over again, so thank you. <laughs> Other questions? I think that's a wrap, so let's say thanks again to Sean. Thank you so much. Fantastic. <laughs>